In the back, there is a handout, which is from Edward Tufta's chapter two of one of his books. He has four books. Uh, I can't remember what he's a professor of at Yale, but he started getting interested in how to display information. And for example, this he considers his the best graph ever made, okay? I mean, if you take his one-day seminar for, uh, I think it's $500, and well, he can they'll be, be that. pardon me? Well, he convinced me that this is easy to graph. Oh, yeah, you have to understand it, but uh, I'll, I'll spend a second with it. But he basically looks at lots of different ways to graph things, and sometimes you can graph things and actually have no value whatsoever to your graph or your table. Um, and sometimes you can have all kinds of information in, in um, put it in one, one, uh, one thing. Tufta um, has gotten into giving these seminars for industry. I took it over here at the Copley Plaza Hotel once. You pay $500 for one day. There's 200 people, so he's collecting $100,000 for the day. Not a bad salary although he does have to pay for the room, which probably cost him $10,000. Um, and uh, when he's giving his seminar, he's made so much money off selling these books and giving these seminars that he has, like he has Sir Francis Bacon's copy of Newton's Principia, okay? And you get to see the pages because he will have underlings in white gloves carrying the book around, showing you the page that you, he wants you to see. Um, uh, so he has a lot of these rare books and stuff because he likes to collect rare books. He has a lot of good ideas. He's also one of the most arrogant people I've ever met. Uh, but aside from that. Um, anyway, this is, you can't read the stuff up here, but it's in French anyway, unless you read French. But this is Napoleon's march from Paris to Moscow. Here's Moscow in, in French. And this should be Paris over here. And this is the, the width of this is the size of his army going out. And then little pieces of the army went off to the side and got sick and went home or whatever. They finally get to uh, Moscow, and here's the army coming back. And you can see the size of the army compared to what it was when it left. Okay, So you can see why it's sort of a lot of information on this graph. And then there's the temperature plotted down here. On the days that they were marching out, it was a cold winter and stuff. But, for example, he considers that one of the most useful graphs, or most, I don't know, I, I can't remember. It's been 15 years since I took his course. But uh, um, he's written four books. He publishes the book himself. They're all on 100% vellum, acid-free paper, because he considers them to be a work of art that you will have forever. Okay. Uh, but they're very inexpensive, too. Like these books are like 60 bucks a piece. I don't have the catalog with me right now. But, um, th however, this little handout uh, costs $5. But it's on 100% uh, rag paper, acid-free, so you will have it forever. Okay? It will not deteriorate. Uh, I went up to him at the, at the lunch break, and I told him, I, you know, Professor... Tufta, I'm a professor, and, and I'd like to use, use this, um, but could I get a, if I buy in bulk, like a 500, could I get a discount? Well, I guess you'd just Xerox it anyway, so I guess I'd better do it. So I got it for four bucks, okay? But it was still 1600 or $2,000 or whatever that I paid for, and I've been using them for a few years uh, for various classes. Anyway, so... Um, Anyway, so this is, we've been talking about decision making. Engineers have to make all kinds of decisions, trade-offs about different things. They also have to learn to communicate what they say. And so communication is supposed to be part of what I'm talking about in, in uh, what we're doing here. So here it is, visual and statistical thinking, displays of evidence for making decisions, okay? And he has two examples in here. This is chapter two of one of the four books. One of them is, um, this is, the first book is the visual display of numbers. The, another one he calls the visual display of words. Another one is the visual display of uh, verbs. 
Oh, not one's nouns, one's one's numbers, one's nouns, one's verbs, and uh, um, another. I don't remember what the fourth one is, but he has he has a nice succinct way. He's he's a good teacher. Okay, and here's one of my favorites: is the PowerPoint uh, version in uh, auto content PowerPoint of the Gettysburg address. Uh, Gettysburg address. Okay, uh, have I shown you this before? Okay, this is the Gettysburg Address in PowerPoint reduced to six PowerPoints. The organizational overview was minus 87 years ago um, versus now, okay? You graph that in a agenda, met on a, I guess I ought to blow this up a little. The agenda met on a battlefield, it's a great battlefield. Dedicate portion of the field, it's fitting. Unfinished work, great task. Review of key objectives and critical success factors, what makes nation unique, conceived in liberty, men are equal, shared vision, new birth of freedom, government uh, of or by the people. Not, a, not on the agenda is dedication, consecrating, hallowing in a narrow sense to add or, direct, to add or detract, nor remember what we say. Summary, a new nation, civil war, dedicate field. He took a great piece of English literature and PowerPoint can redu reduce it to pure drivel, okay? Uh, I use this as, now that you're getting your PowerPoints ready for your presentations, uh, PowerPoint is, <clears throat> it's a great crutch for people to present their outline or to read from it. Um, the best lecturers, the ones who make lots of money, uh, like Lester Thoreau making $30,000 a lecture in 1988, or Tufta making $100,000 for a day's worth of teaching, they don't use PowerPoints. I mean, I talked to you about that before. You really want to have the, have the audience focus on you and what you're saying rather than up there looking and trying to figure out what the graph means. Um, in fact, I think even uh, Tufta, who thinks that the graph of Napoleon's march to Moscow and back is one of the greatest graphs, he wouldn't, he wouldn't expect it to be a useful thing to just put up. Because just like Catherine said, what's this? You know, I mean, it's too complex. But once you actually get a little bit of an explanation, oh, gee, you know, that's pretty neat, right? All of a sudden, you have a visual image of how many people got lost and where, and okay, and then show you some of those lines where they were crossing a river that was frozen or something, and people fell in and froze and things like that. But anyway. But I want to take you through in the scientific method, and we talked about the scientific method before. Do people remember the four key points of the scientific method? I wasn't that impressed with how many people rattled them off. I think you rattled them off, started to rattle them off. You first collect the data, okay? If you have a pro the, the uh, reference I gave you started with defining the problem, but Assume, assuming you know what your problem is, you've got to collect data about it. You have to analyze it, develop a hypothesis, and test it. And only then can you draw conclusions. Now, this has been around for thousands of years. Uh, I think Aristotle and others used it. Um, but if you develop a hypothesis and test it and it doesn't work, you got to go back and develop a new hypothesis. And you keep on doing this until you develop a hypothesis that can't, cannot be refuted. Okay? Uh, if you, you're trying to falsify your hypothesis, your test should be designed to show that your hypothesis is false. If you, do, if you do your testing and you cannot show it's false, then the conclusion is it must be true, okay? And there's a quote from somebody famous, can't remember who, but um, when we've tested something and the only thing that remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth, okay? If we've eliminated all the other possibilities, okay? Uh, maybe it's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle or someone. Uh, and that's good old um, uh, Sherlock Holmes used deduction, right? 
uh, to solve the problems. Now, there's also induction in the, the thing I gave you, about three or four pages on the scientific method, is the most complete description I've ever seen. It talks about confirmation bias, where people draw their conclusions in the beginning too early, before they've uh, laid out enough hypotheses to test, and they don't eliminate all the other possibilities. Um, for example, I gave you the thing out of Kahneman's book where someone had looked at the data and they found kidney cancer was worse in the poor rural counties, right? And you can define that as the cause. It also, it turns out, if you look at the data another way, you find that kidney cancer was least in all those counties. So it was the worst and the least, depending on what county you're talking about. That was, as Kahneman said, that was the statistics of small numbers. Uh, if you're not averaging over a, a large enough populace. Uh, there's expectation bias. You think that this is the cause, uh, and so you end up proving it's the cause. The confirmation bias, I often call, call it the reverse scientific method. You draw your conclusion, you throw out all data that doesn't fit, and you go backwards, and you, it's circular reasoning. You, you start with your conclusion and end up concluding the same thing. You're just going around in circles. You don't accept any data that doesn't fit, OK? So if you were going this way rather than this way, you would not have that if you, um, if you avoid confirmation bias. You will test all the potential uh, theories. So uh, Tufta gives us two examples. One is John Snow, who in, um, well, let's see what he says here. This is general for both of them, OK? What? You know Snow? No. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, this John Snow was actually the anesthetist to Queen Victoria. Now, why she needed her own as anesthetist? How many times have you, have you ever been anesthetized? But anyway, uh, so he was a medical doctor. Anyway, uh, Tufta likes to point out that depending on how you display your data and analyze it you may get better results than others. And he gives us a successful um, story and an unsuccessful story. Um, and what happened was cholera broke out in, bro in the Broad Street area of central London in, in 1854. John Snow had investigated earlier epidemics, suspected the water from a community pump, um, water pump, was contaminated. Well, this is before we really had clean water. I mean, in the 19th century, people were lucky to have clean water. People didn't understand bacteria in 1854. Um, and he talks about what some of the theories were that um, you, got, you contracted cholera through the air and things like that. But he had a hypothesis, OK? He had a good idea. And he was going to use that hypothesis to test the data. And he was then going to um, evaluate things. And he goes through, and it goes through the whole process of considering other things even after you think you've proven things. So down here at the bottom of this is a graph showing the death rate starting on um, August 31st. People started dying, peaked the next day, and then it started decaying. Here's the cumulative death rate. 600 people died uh, during this ep epidemic of only a few days, about a week's time so far as that goes. And you've got some of these graphs if you picked up one of these things in the back. Um, but what he did is he plotted on a map of London, and it turns out right here in the center, uh, there's a little dot. Let's see if I can, it says pump. See pump? It says pump. Not very clear because it's small. This is the most deaths, okay? Each one of these represents a little line, and so the longer the bar, uh, you can see the individual lines. This, this thing's not sharp enough to, to distinguish them. You can think of each one as a little coffin, okay? He has a picture later of little coffins. Uh, so he plotted it. Turns out on September 7th, he talked to the local town officials in that part of London, and he uh, explained to them that he thought that it was the water that everybody was drinking from the community pump. And so they took the handle, the next day, the town officials took the pump, the handle off, and the death rate decreased. Now, um, 
you have to consider alternative eth explanations uh, in contrary cases. For example, gee, it was already decreasing before he even did this, right? And so it goes through and it explains. You have to say, well, why is that? Well, maybe it's not the right hypothesis if it already had started to decrease. But in fact, what had happened, everyone was fleeing the neighborhood after two days of, of you know, 180 people dying in one day or whatever the number was. Uh, a lot of people de decided to go visit the relatives in the country. Good idea, okay? And so therefore, all, you, don't, you didn't have a constant population. And if you could have corrected for that population, you may have found that it was staying constant. And he gives a lot of anecdotal examples of, um, there was this one woman, elderly woman, and uh, um, she loved the, uh, the taste of the water from the Broad Street pump. And so once a week or something, her, her nephew or son or something would go into London, and she would have him bring back uh, some water from the Broad Street pump. And he did, and she died the next day even though she was a long way away from central London, okay? Yeah, or whatever. I mean, yeah. Oh, okay. She was elderly. Yeah, with cholera may take two days, but she, if you're elderly, it may take only one day yeah. as you get deathly sick, okay? Uh, in any case, the story's in here, okay? I don't remember all the details. You can read it. I didn't, it's not something that's in my general knowledge. Uh, but he goes through a couple of pages here to talk about uh, how they track down some of the outliers, okay? And they could, all of a sudden, as you can explain the outliers, the ones that seem to disprove your hypothesis, and then you find that, oh, those have an explanation too, all you're doing is reinforcing your hypothesis, right? So far as that goes. So he goes on for several pages. We're not going to go through all that. He, po he points out that you can plot, it, plot the deaths on a daily basis, same plot we showed you before, or you can plot it on a weekly basis. Sometimes when you aggregate things, in this case, you still see the decrease, but sometimes when you start averaging things, you can get really bad data. And actually, he gives you another example from something else uh, that shows you've got a little peak here, but if you average over a certain amount, actually averaging is something that um, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers do a lot. In signal analysis, they may have a moving window or they have a Kalman filter they have different types of ways to filter the data to take the noise out. Sometimes you can take the real data out, too. <laughs> if you filter out enough, you just get a straight line. And here's a little plot of Queen Victoria, uh, Jon Snow, and a plot of coffins. Okay, so that's, you can read the whole story yourself. It's actually um, good reading when you're doing nothing, okay? So the next one is the Space Shuttle Ch Challenger, Challenger disaster, um, which was, not, what, 1986. Um, and here's the Space Shuttle, and it has solid, two solid rocket motors. It has one uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hy uh, hydrogen tank, the center tank. That's expendable. The solid rocket model, uh, uh, ro rocket motors, are actually recoverable. They'd have a parachute, they'd eject them and it fall into the ocean and uh, they'd recover it and reuse it. Whereas the, the main tank uh, was not rec recoverable. It went further out into space and got burned up in the atmosphere. But the solid rocket mo motors were um, used in, uh, uh, were reusable, designed to be reusable. And in order to be reusable, these things are so big, you had to build them in modules, and you had to have O-ring seals, or they had, you didn't have to have O-ring seals, you could have done something else, I guess. But they had a double O-ring seal. And there's different pictures of this in the, uh, in the uh, booklet, but they knew that good old NASA has things down to 58.788 seconds. Wow, good, okay, I'm glad they know it's that accurate to the millisecond. But you could see a little white spot at one of these O-ring seals as the solid fuel was coming out, okay? And you, the nice thing, well, anybody know the advantage of using a liquid fuel, liquid uh, in the main tank and a solid in the, um, or the disadvantage of solid rocket motors? Yeah. The solid rockets um, don't they just keep going once they start? Yep, once you ignite it, there's no way to stop it. Okay, can't put it out. 
because it actually is a solid fuel that contains its own oxidant and fuel mixed together. It doesn't need air, okay? Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, you got valves and you, you got a flowing liquid, you can shut the valve and all of a sudden you can throttle back your, uh, your energy, okay? So the solid rocket motors, that's pretty blunt force rocketry. You light it and you hope for the best, okay? Whereas something that has a, you know, that you can meter a liquid uh, has certain advantages. And obviously as you're getting up there and you're starting to maneuver and stuff, you'd like to change your power. And that's why they have uh, uh, a liquid fueled rocket. Okay, um, so they knew what had happened. It was blow by the seals. And how many people know the story of how people analyzed it? Hey, you know the story of? Well, both. I mean, um, well, after they like basically collected all the pieces they could do, I don't know all the tests, but yep. basically did post failure analysis on it, plus all the videos and compared. Yeah, I mean, NASA basically it's shut one down. Of those reports, it's actually in the same section. Like they, they do that after every launch. It's just you get a bajillion more reports. After well, NASA basically shut down for about two and a half years. Yeah. There were no shuttle flights for two and a half years. Um, and what is the main purpose of the shuttle? Anybody know the main purpose of building the space shuttle? What do they tell the public and what do they tell the hidden, hidden secret sessions of Congress? Well, to take astronauts into space, it's public. Huh? It's by satellites, but for the public, it was um, the, uh, the space truck. It right. Be cheap. It's a shuttle, yeah. just like the shuttle from here to New York, right? That's why they called it the shuttle. And at the time, it cost $10,000 a pound to put a payload, a pound of payload into orbit, okay? It still does, okay? The shuttle was advertised in the early 70s as it was gonna drop the price by a factor of 10 and it was gonna only cost $1,000 a pound. That's to get into orbit, okay? And people say, oh, we could colonize the moon. Yeah, at $20,000 a pound, okay? That means, you know, it, it, it would pay to have someone go on a diet before they go on their flight, right? <laughs> Um, the the vehicle assembly building was built for the idea that we were going to colonize Mars and we were going to be putting out a new rocket every month. Right. Every four weeks. They had schedules, and, but as you said, the, the real reason or the real justification um, was military. They had to get uh, payloads into orbit. They wanted to be able to get there and work on them, okay? Uh, like the International Space Station, but they had military objects that were hush-hush, like space-based lasers. And it turns out, just by coincidence, Rockwell International had the contract for the space-based uh, laser weapon. And there are various ways, you know, there's things that are classified. And fortunately, before I ever had a security clearance, I didn't have to worry about what I figured out because I never learned it through, through classified means, right? Because I didn't have a clearance. So I had figured out through three different things that the power of a um, space-based laser weapon was 50 megawatts, okay? The Air Force was trying to get a, um, I'm sorry, it was five megawatts. The Air Force was trying to get a 50 megawatt generator, superconducting generator, and I'd worked on superconductivity in the early 70s, and so it kind of it was known the Air Force wanted a uh, 50 megawatt generator. It's known that the lasers, the chemical lasers, were about 10% efficient. I can multiply 50 by 0.1 and come up with 5 megawatts as the laser power. Uh, Professor Bowen was l working on one meter diameter laser windows for Lincoln Laboratory, forging these things out of potassium chloride. No one had ever tried to make very high purity, low imperfection, you know, no dislocations or voids and stuff. And, uh, things of potassium fluoride and potassium chloride and cesium chloride and stuff. No one had ever tried to do that before. But that's because the wavelength of the laser, this was transparent to the, that particular wavelength of the laser. You could look in the literature and you could find the, the, um, the damage threshold per square centimeter of laser power that could go through it. You could multiply it by one meter, which is what he was trying, you know, separate contract. You put the two together and you come up with five megawatts. And then there was something else. I don't remember what the other one was. So I asked a friend of mine um, uh, who worked in the aerospace industry in California. I said, Charlie, do you know what the high, highest power, uh, what the, 
the space-based lasers uh, power would be. I, I figured it out and I told him my two, two uh, methods. And he says, well, we have the main contract for that, so I really shouldn't tell you. But let me tell you that it's a pretty good estimate you've got. And what's more, it fits perfectly in the, in the cargo bay of the shuttle. <laughs> okay, this was in like 1978 or something he was telling me this, okay? Uh, there are other things. Um, who was it? Um, I was just talking to, oh, I was talking to a woman who lives around the corner, and she happened to, her son is working at Lawrence Livermore. He's working on the supercomputer. And so they had, a, I don't know, something. But she went to visit Lawrence Livermore Lab. And Lawrence Livermore Lab, as you know, is one of our weapons labs. I have visited there once because I had a student doing a thesis, and he was, he's still at Lawrence Livermore. And every, every building I went in had one of these little uh, uh, triangular temporary signs, and it would say, Un uncleared visitor today, which meant everybody had to keep their file cabinets locked while I was there, even though I had like three people escorting me everywhere I went. Uh, I was never any safer than... The only time I was any safer than that was when the KGB was following me in Moscow and Kiev, okay? And then I was, I was safe as long as they didn't turn on me, right? Uh, but, you know, I had a police escort wherever I went, right? Uh, well, here at Lawrence Livermore, I had a security escort wherever I went. Anyway, so this, this uh, woman around the street was, and she's a, she's a virtu virtuoso violinist, okay? She's not technically inclined, although uh, her son is a computer scientist. Uh, she said she started telling me about um, this big laser. I said, uh, 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 I said, uh, you mean NIF? Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. And they're gonna, they're gonna, they're doing fusion. And uh, she actually, she's pretty bright. She, she asked the question, well, how much power have you gotten out of this? As they tell her, this is nothing yet. Okay, we haven't, we haven't reached break even. You know, spent all these billion dollars, been working for fifty years. And then I explained to her, well, the real reason for the National Ignition Facility is to simulate nuclear weapons because we can't do uh, actual weapons tests anymore. So they built this $5 billion laser or set of lasers so they can hit something small and they can implode it, get nuclear fusion, and test their weapons, the physics of their weapons. So a lot of things are sort of dual use. They tell, they tell the public one thing, we're trying to make free energy uh, by nuclear fusion which they sort of are, but the main reason they're doing it is to simulate nuclear weapons effects. Anyway, um, one day before the flight, the predicted temperature for the launch was 26 to 29 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the engineers who designed the rocket opposed the launching of the Challenger. So you were, gonna, were you going to tell me more about that part of it? This is where the gravity really comes in, because the way they present this management is chronologically little rocket graphics. Yep. Oh my god. They're in here. Okay, the little rocket graphics are further and ahead. Furthermore, furthermore, even when you plot the data properly, it starts to look like there isn't that much of a trend with what if you exclude one outlier. Right. right? So, so you can either choose, oh, this is exponential, or this one thing is an outlier and we're going to be fine. Well, so, um, they, if they had more data since they were in the construction of it, if they could say, hey, this material isn't meant for that, then that was the data they needed. Because the data they presented before was not useful. Well, they sort of presented the wrong data. They presented <laughs> data on blow-by, which is twice before they had had some soot get past the O-rings. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, it's 4,000 degrees on one side of the O-ring, and it's, you know, whatever the ambient temperature is up there, minus 30 degrees in the atmosphere. Um, on the other side, the joint, here's a close-up of the joint. I mean, you've got the book, so I'm not going to blow all these up as nice as it could be. But basically, uh, here's the unstressed joint. When things get hot, there's going to be, that's why they have to have two O-rings in here, and you can get blow-by one or two. And, but Tufta, um, who likes to be critical, um, said one of the problems with this, these presentations, and here are the handwritten presentations that Morton Thiokol, the designer of the solid rocket motor, uh, who was a contractor to NASA, uh, they didn't provide the names of the people who prepared the material, so no one was going to be responsible for this. Okay, But it turns out the engineers at Morton Thiokol, which was out in Ogden, Utah or somewhere, um, 
uh, they had been successful on 24 flights, and they were the the engineers went to the thiocol engineers went to the thiocol managers, and said, "Well, we don't think you should you should uh, fly tomorrow." And they had already postponed it once. And do you know any of the politics about the flight? Yeah. It Well, Thiokol was sort of in that position. Thiokol had a $1.3 billion, $1 billion continuation contract to continue for the next set of shuttles. Uh, and so the manager, the upper managers really wanted to please NASA. Uh, on the other part of the political spectrum, um, this was the one that Kristen McAuliffe, the teacher from New Hampshire, and a few other people were on. And it just so happened Ronald Reagan was going to give his State of the Union that night. Okay, and they were talking about potentially once they're up there in orbit, actually his talking to Crystal McAuliffe during the State of the Union address. Hey, you know, and you know, everybody says, well, we wouldn't, we didn't postpone it for that. I mean, we we would have postponed it even if we if we would have missed that opportunity. Yeah, in some people's minds, but in any case, it was still there. And what happened? Um, there was this engineer named Bostioli who was one of the ones who helped prepare some of these slides and said, you can't do this. It's, it's going to, we, we have too high risk of failure. So the Thiokol engineers basically take that and they water it down. They call NASA in Huntsville or whatever, and they say, we don't recommend launching. And NASA call managers right back or call back or fax back and say, this is days of faxes and say, well, you've never told us not to launch before. <laughs> what does that have to do with any of this sort of a sunk cost, you know, uh, problem? Uh, and there was all these politics going on, and there actually been whole books written about this. Okay, and Bostioli is, you know, they they actually had a conference call scheduled. They were in the conference call, and it wasn't going very well for the decision not to launch. And NASA was trying to push Thiokol, and the Thiokol managers were trying to push their engineers into saying everything was okay. And so they finally decided to cut off the conference call and just have the Thiokol managers talk to the engineers. And one vice president of Thiokol told Bostioli, uh, I think his name was Bob, uh, Bob, take, take off your engineer hat and put on your manager's hat, okay? Well, to me, that's, you know, I already told you, engineering and management are basically the same. You can't take off one hat and put the other on. But, um, they kind of pressured Bostioli. Everybody's telling Bostioli, well, don't worry about it, Bob. It's no problem. No, no, everything's fine. Um, and they had, pl they had plotted it wrong. They had plotted blow by, and they didn't plot. They ha actually did have the data on there. This is one of the plots. And they have the temperature of the expected day. And they also had a, they had, um, this is SRM 25. This is the 25th shuttle flight, OK? Uh, and they'd had 24 successful shuttle, shuttle launches. And NASA had done a multi-million dollar study showing that the probability of having a failure on liftoff um, uh, of a shuttle was 1 in 10,000. Okay? Now, it turns out in the investigation later, uh, Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel laureate from Caltech, he started out at MIT. He went, his career went downhill from there. He went to Princeton and then Caltech. Um, but he graduated from MIT and has a bachelor's degree in physics. But MIT will, physics department will not admit their own um, students. They think there's plenty of other good physics departments. And that's, that's true. Okay? If, there are plenty of other good physics departments. So he went to Princeton. And he wrote books about the difference between Princeton and MIT. Um, and they went to Caltech. And he came up with quantum chromodynamics and won the Nobel Prize. Um, and he was sort of a spokesman for science. Anyway, when they, at, the, at the hearing, apparently, when NASA was saying, well, this is a very rare event, and we, we estimated the probability is 1 in 10,000 for a failure. And Feynman said, well, I went back and looked at all the shots since uh, World War II when we started rocketry. And we've had failures on 4% 4 4 of our rocket flights. And this was the 25th shuttle flight, which is sort of coincidence, because anyone knows if it really was 4%. But we won't get into the statistics of that. Uh, but anyway, they had temperature of the O-ring, but they really were, this is history of temperatures. 
But this was, uh, the slide before was blow-by history where you got a little soot past it. The, the O-ring history was a little different. They actually had O-rings, one of the O-rings basically burn up. And so you only had one O-ring left as the seal on some of these others. So two previous launches, uh, they had blow-by, um, and then they had some O-ring damage on SRM-15. SRM-15 was the next lowest temperature flight they had ever had, 53 degrees versus 29. And here on the next page, Tufta gives two ways to, you can do it in tabular form, if you know that temperature is your important variable, and the coldest launch they'd ever had was 53 degrees, they had had a damage index of 11 on the O-rings. They had only had two blow-by incidences, one at 53, one at 75. But you can look here and you see, gee, there's sort of a cluster of O-ring damage here, and then there's a few that had some O-ring damage. They lost the rocket motor case in the ocean on that one. And you can plot it as a graph. And if you plot it as a graph, here's the, the index of damage, which is sort of going up like this. I mean, you, you, you know, you got some data points here, but if I had to take all those, you kind of see this curve kind of going up like that, okay? And here's our temperature over here. If anyone had looked at this graph the day before the, the flight, they might have said, hmm, maybe we should look a little closer at O-ring damage. Um, it becomes obvious in hindsight, which is part of what all this is. Uh, but what he's pointing out is you really do need to uh, uh, look at the data the right way or you can miss the important parts of it. So here's Feynman, and he was testifying before Congress, and he went out and he asked for a cup of ice water. They thought it was because he wanted to drink it. But in fact, he had gone to the hardware store and he picked up a C-clamp and he had a piece of rubber tubing and he basically clamped it, put it in the ice water and showed how it was no longer, no longer, when he clamped it and put it in the ice water, got it cold, took it out, undid the clamp, you could see it didn't spring back to its original shape right away. There's no resiliency at lower temperatures for rubber. So uh, that was how he demonstrated. Then Tufta talks about how even Feynman knew that was sort of a Mickey Mouse experiment, but it still kind of showed the point. Um, and here it talks about the difficulty for the rocket maker to deny the demands of its major, demands of its major client. NASA was really pushing for the go-ahead, okay? There was a possibility of televised conversation of Crystal McAfee with President Reagan. Um, and then Feynman said uh, in the final report, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations for nature cannot be fooled. So, um, and then some of the stuff that I have in the book by um, Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, you know, you have your kind of intuitive thing. Boss Jolie kind of intuitively note, noted, we never tested these things at 29 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, we thought we were going to be going in, in Florida, at Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral, okay? Uh, in fact, they usually were, but it was an unusually cold time in Cape Canaveral. I'm sure our, we probably lost a billion dollars worth of oranges that, that week, okay? Um, but anyway, um, so there's a successful uh, thing with Jon Snow, an unsuccessful one with the space sh shuttle. But the other thing about the space shuttle is engineers, or Boss Jolie went on the, well, he resigned from uh, Morton Thiokol, and he went on the lecture circuit and he used to say he wished he had stuck to his guns and told them, the managers, that they were wrong, okay? But he took off his engineer's hat and uh, put on the manager's hat and uh, it ended up sort of destroying the, the uh, space shuttle program if you really get down to it. I mean, they, they did get back on it for after two and a half years. In the meantime, the Defense Department is getting really nervous because they needed to get satellites up there and I don't know if you know, before they finally canceled the shuttle program a couple of years ago, like 90% of the flights were all military flights that were scheduled. Because the, mil and the military, I was in some of the meetings in Washington where the military was just, what are we gonna do if we don't have a shuttle? Because, and they, well, now they come along and you have private enterprise uh, running flights and things like that. 
I guess there's one aside in that uh, I was testifying in an aircraft engine failure over here in the Cambridge courthouse. Uh, and they were asking me what I'd worked on and, uh, and what I taught. And I don't remember how it came up, but I basically said, well, um, things fail. And for example, we have the Space Shuttle Challenger. And NASA, NASA knows there's going to be another failure sometime in the next 15 or 20 years. And uh, we just don't know when it's going to be. Guess what happened the next morning? The Columbia blew up. And on Monday, the other side settled the case because the expert predicted it on the stand. <laughs> I said I, we don't know what it's going to be, but it just happened. It was the next day. And the insurance people were so nervous that some of the jurors would think that I was a prophet who could never be wrong. <laughs> okay, woo! <laughs> so that was the end of that case. <clears throat> That's a true story. I was sort of surprised by all that, but anyway, so was a few other people. Um, anyway, uh, I want to talk now about what the engineer's responsibility is. I didn't bring a copy of the structural welding code, but this is relevant to some other things we're going to go over in design safety factors and things like that. But the structural welding code is um, the steel welding code, which this came out of, the structural welding code steel. Is about an inch thick, comes out about every three or four years, um, costs about $400, $500. Uh, there's a problem with codes and standards. Back 20 years ago, I could have bought that code for $75, basically not much more than the cost of printing. Uh, I have a set of American Society for Testing and Materials x ray, x ray, uh, x ray radiographs, so you actually x rays that they took of actually pieces of metal with different types of casting and welding defects. When I bought them in the mid-1990s, they were two or $300 a piece. Now they're $2,000 a piece, same stuff, okay? Um, there's a, a, a manual put together by the Defense Department and the Federal Aviation Administration that gives the properties of materials. It used to be called uh, Mill Standard, Mill Handbook 5, from Military Handbook 5. But it was a joint thing between the Federal Aviation Administration for commercial and the Defense Department for military aircraft. And if anybody, Boeing, Sikorsky, anybody was building uh, uh, an aircraft for the military, or if they're building a commercial aircraft, they had to follow the properties in this manual. A lot of the stuff in the manual came from Boeing or Alcoa or US Steel or whatever. But it's just a collection like this. I bought it about six or seven. They came out, they gave it a, a new, new name. It's called the MMPDS or something, Metallic Materials Properties Data Sheets or something like that. It's 11 volumes. It's about this thick. I paid 110 bucks for it because it was printed by the government printing office. Government printing office is not allowed to make a profit. Okay? Um, and you, at the time, you could download it, get a digital file, which I didn't do, kick myself now. You could get a digital file for free, okay? So I was just involved in uh, another matter that involved aluminum, <laughs> and I was talking to some people, and I said, well, you can get this for free, and the person said, no, it's now $700. Because what the government has done is they've turned it over to a private company, and I don't know how they're sharing the stuff and how they get around Congress's mandate that the government's not supposed to make money off these things. But it doesn't matter whether it's this particular document or other professional societies who write standards, they've all decided writing standards is a gold mine. The ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, the granddaddy code, is $16,000 and they come out with a new one every three years. Okay, if you're building pressure vessels, you gotta buy one. Because you gotta know what the code says. It's written into law. You cannot build a pressure vessel and operate it anywhere in the United States without following the ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code. It's, it's written into law. They will not give you certification in the state you're in. Each state regulates it unless you can show that you met the ASME design requirements and fabrication requirements. So there's lots of codes. The, the structural welding code's gone up 400% in price. Uh, they used to 
redo these codes not that often. For a while, they actually were trying to redo this one every year, and then people start screaming, this is ridiculous. Okay, the prices are getting out of, out of hand. But in any case, this is written into code. This code is written into law in, Mass in many cases in Massachusetts, in New York City, most other states. This is kind of the international standard for welding of steel. And on page one, um, page one, which is general requirements, and 1.1 is the scope of the code and what it, what it involves and the limitations on the code. The definitions, the first thing is the engineer. The engineer shall be defined as a duly designated individual who acts for and in behalf of the owner on all matters within the scope of the code. And then it goes, it's not going alphabetically. The second one that it defines is the contractor. This is the person who's going to do the welding. Contractor shall be defined as any company or that individual representing a company responsible for the fabrication, erection, manufacturing, or welding in conformance with the provisions of this code. The owner shall be defined as the individual or company that exercises legal ownership of the product or structural assembly. So the owner could be some financial group on Wall Street. The engineer is some guy who's going to have to put his stamp of approval on the design of this thing. And he's usually working for the owner. In fact, specifically, he should always be working for the owner. In the back of the code, it goes through, on page 415, it goes through a commentary. Uh, C means commentary for section 1. And the engineer, definitions. The code does not define the engineer in terms of education, professional registration, professional license, area of specialization, or other criterion. This code does not provide for a test of engineer's competence or ability. However, the assumption throughout this code as it relates to responsibilities and, authority, and authorities assigned to the engineer is that the individual is competent and capable of executing the, his, these responsibilities. Okay, applicable building codes. If you're going to build a building, you've got to use the code. The building contract will probably call out this code. May have requirements to be met by the engineer. These remarks, anyway, okay. Um, the contractor or inspector. inspector um, there's most times the engineer works for the owner, and the owner is employing the contractor, but the engineer is basically supposed to be looking over the contractor's shoulder and sort of doing the quality control, quality assurance function. For some applications of this code, one entity functions as both the engineer and contractor. In this code, this is referred to as the original equipment manufacturer. So anyone, you know what a butler building is? A prefabricated building? Butler in Kansas was the first big company to make prefabricated buildings. You send them a, I want a two-story steel building that uh, is 50 feet by 75 feet and I'm going to build it in this area of the country where the snow loads are such and such, blah, blah, blah. And Butler will design it for you, they will fabricate it, they'll ship it on trucks, and you can have it erected in a week. Okay? And there's all kinds of Butler buildings. They usually recognize them as this cheap looking metal building. And they have been designed down to just a very little bit. Responsibilities, the engineer's responsibilities. And this goes on for a couple of pages. I'm not going to actually, keeps on going for all of this. It's engineer's responsibilities, okay? Um, and then you get to contractor's responsibilities. Build it, <laughs> okay? But all the rest of it is engineer's responsibility. So the engineer really has the bulk of the responsibility for the whole thing. And we're going to talk about how the engineer's responsibility has changed um, over the last 20 years and how we have come to new types of design criteria now that we have the wonders of modern computers, which sometimes can get you in trouble. Okay, so I will be in on Friday. Simone will be doing the next three days. I'll be in Canada.